Hello, we are continuing in our same series called Unity, Even When We Don't Agree. And we've been talking about what God has called us to as the body of Christ, to, to be connected and cooperating with each other, even, even when we don't see things the same for the sake of the gospel. So cooperating because of what Jesus is going to do and what he's done. And I want to tell you a key question, a key component of that unity, and that is loyalty. So this weekend we're going to talk about where is your loyalty? What is your loyalty to? In fact, I think the Bible word used, that we use is the word faithfulness. And we want to be faithful to God and we want to be faithful to what he's called us to. And I hope that there's a, a great degree in which you want to be faithful to what God has called Family Church to. And so we're going to wrestle with that question. What is loyalty and what does it take to make you quit? And I want to draw your attention to a film that I was told about and it's called Force Majeure. And it's a Swedish film. I have really no idea what the level of the film is, but it's uh, mostly in, in uh, Swedish, so I wouldn't recommend it. But it tells the story of this family, and they are vacationing in this beautiful resort area, and they know that there's going to be a, a, a controlled travel, tra avalanche that's triggered. So it's an intentional thing. And so they're sitting, first of all, and they're watching it, and the snow is coming down the hill. And then there's a moment where it looks like it's going to get life-threatening. And in that moment, this husband and his wife and their two kids have a moment of reality. Because when it looks like it's going to be something that's going to be serious, in this next cut, you see that the, the husband gets up and they're all terrified. And he takes off without any thought of protecting or being there for his wife and kids. And in that moment, there is something that's broken. And the, the avalanche turns out to not be a crisis at all. It is controlled and it dies down and there's no threat. But there's been a, a, a huge break because that wife and those kids know that when it comes down to that kind of a crisis, it's really every man for himself and that the husband and dad is really all about himself. And the rest of the movie goes on exploring how he denies that that was a problem and, and he didn't really run from them and, and they keep bringing it up and they want to have this resolved and essentially it dissolves that family. And so here's a key question is, how do we have that spirit of loyalty and faithfulness and commitment to the right things at the right time in the right way? So let me just ask you as we walk through this. The first level of commitment is we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and Paul is giving his, his kind of last challenge to a young man named Timothy who is a pastor at Ephesus. And Paul has poured into to Timothy as well as many others who are serving the Lord in different places. And, and he wants to give him some kind of last words kind of advice. And so he's talking about, first of all, what does it mean to be loyal to Christ? What does it mean to follow him? And I want you to look at 2 Timothy, and I'm going to start reading in verse 2. He says to him, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. When you're ready, when you're on stage, when people are watching, and when they're not. And then he says, Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Those are the, the different ways in which you're going to challenge people to the Word of God. And then he says, with great patience and careful instruction. I want you to notice that. Great patience and careful instruction. We've been talking about unity is built on my head, what I know, how it sinks into my heart and what I really believe, and then it comes out my mouth. And the way that we interact with people who disagree or, or who are even wrong. And again, the words here, he talked before about being humble, about being kind, about being gentle. And here he uses the words with great patience and careful instruction. Let me tell you, if you're leading a group of people, you will need those. And then he says, and he goes on here, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And he, and he says, I want you to get this. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And I'm here to tell you that time is here. We are there. He describes this. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Kind of a funny metaphor. He says, basically, they're going to look for people who tell them what they want to hear. They got an itch here and they want you to scratch it. And so if you don't agree, if you're trying to, in this case, hold to sound doctrine, then they're going to tune you out and then... They're going to find people who will tell them exactly what they want to hear. And then he goes on and he says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. 
So the first thing that we need to do is we need to be loyal to Christ. He says, I want you to, to stay true to the word. I want it to be in season and out of season. We, we talked last week about having anchor bolts that are drilled into the foundation because the wind is going to howl and the waves are going are to hit. And he says, I want you to stay true to Christ. So let me just be clear. As we have talked about unity, I want to be clear that unity does not mean compromise. That when we are talking about unity, we're not talking about just going with the flow. In fact, in fact, I would say that as we, as we look at how people respond to the culture that we're in, and we, we are officially in a post-Christian culture in America, uh, there were many things in the founding of our nation that, that were based on God's word and at least had biblical values if they didn't have a personal relationship with Christ. And, and that day has passed. The, the common popular views of sexuality is no longer lining up with what the Bible says, one man, one woman, and sex is reserved for marriage and for life. That, that is an old way of seeing things according to many people in our culture. The idea of the sanctity of life, both in the womb and when people are old. The idea of how, how alcohol and drugs are to impact us. Uh, education, finances. There, there are so many ways in which the, the culture that we live in is no longer lined up with the things that the scripture teaches. And unity together, and even unity and kindness towards people who disagree does not mean compromise. In fact, I think, I think we often have two different ways we think you can respond to that. That when we get pressed by the culture, some people think we need to revolt, we need to stand up, we need to, to react in a, an aggressive way to let people know that is not okay. And they, they see any other reaction as becoming sheeple, you may have heard that term, to just, just buckle under and go with the flow and just fit in. And I believe the Bible calls us to a third way, to the idea of being deeply rooted in the gospel and having our core values based on Jesus and to never waver from those. But the way that we present them is not in anger and aggression. The way we present them is by showing the love that we have for each other, the love we have for God, even the love we have for people that disagree. There's supposed to be a revolution of love, not of anger and of, and of aggressiveness. And that we can hold to the things that are true and not compromise without becoming reactive and aggressive. And so the, the values that we hold dear will not become the values of a person who does not have God inside of them. God's values are based on God inside of us. And so our core desire is that our unity and our standing for the truth is so that the world may know, so that people will come to hear and see who Jesus is. And, and when they know Jesus and love Jesus and accept his salvation, then they're beginning to be willing to, to see what he says about how we talk and how we live and what our homes are like and, and all of those other ethics and values. So we, we can't enforce those values on someone that doesn't have the life of Christ inside of them. And there's, there's no way in which we can do that at this point. So we want to be, first of all, loyal to Christ. And then secondly, we want to be loyal to the calling. And what we mean by calling is that God has a specific plan for your life. And the, the scripture says that we are saved to do good works, that there is a process that our good works do not lead us to salvation. In fact, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. It's a total gift of grace. And then Ephesians 2.10 says that after we've received that grace and we've become a part of God's family, then what happens is he gives us assignments and that because we are his workmanship, he gives us work to do. And so there's this beautiful balance that comes out of that and he's not called us all to the same thing. So let me be clear. There is a gospel calling and the gospel calling has to do with what it means to be a disciple. And we have characterized that in our church in a very simple way that we put into a triangle. But here's what Paul says in his own story about his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. You see, he says, I have, I have followed what God called me to do. When God got a hold of him on that road to Damascus, he said, there's many things you're going to suffer for my sake. And Paul said, I have stayed true 
to telling people about Jesus everywhere I've gone, sometimes at great cost to myself. And then he says to also, not only to me, but also to all those who've longed for his appearing. So he says for us as well, that there is a a core calling that we are meant to be part of the kingdom of God and we are to be extending and building that kingdom in all the different areas of our life. And, And we will do that differently, but we are called to the same thing. And in this triangle, we talk about these three basic things, that I am following Jesus. I've made a personal commitment that out of love for what he's done for me, I'm going to say, I want to follow you with the rest of my life. And then we are being changed by Jesus, which means that the Holy Spirit within us is is reworking our way of seeing the world so that our our attitudes change and our hearts change and our and our mouth changes. And that is a transformation, not a confirmation. And then the last thing is we are on mission with Jesus. That to become a follower of Jesus means that what's valuable and important to Jesus is what I am about. And obviously, the saving of the world and drawing people to himself. So the thing that we unite around is what the church has been called to, to build the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew, in, in Matthew, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest of the stuff will be added to you. And so, That's our general calling. That's for every single believer. And then we also have an individual calling. In other words, God's given us different spiritual gifts. He's given us different heart people that we are connected with and and want to reach out to. We have different abilities. We have different personalities. We have different experiences. And and God uses those to shape your individual calling. And, And I hope we can quit talking about just pastors or missionaries being called. I hope you begin to see that every one of us is called. And if we're going to be called to what God wants us, it will always be being part of a church because the gospel calling implies that if you're going to obey the New Testament, you have to be in a church family to do that. And then our individual calling is to help us vitally connect with other believers who have the same general calling. So our individual callings are unique and they also have different seasons. God may call us to one thing at certain season and then he may change our calling And that is a good and beautiful thing. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Pastor Zach Newman is our pastor of spiritual development, and many of you already know him. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what God is doing in his life right now. And so why don't you give us a little background, first of all, Zachariah, about how you came to Family Church and a little bit about how long you've been here and that sort of thing. Sure. So in 2004, my wife and I moved to Douglas County because my father and I bought a pizza restaurant in Myrtle Creek. And honestly, in the beginning, it was all about pizza and dollars. Till about 2010, uh, being a pizza maker became not enough for me. And as I sought God on that, um, he said, I gave you people to steward. And so I started pouring into those people and it became the thing that I loved there. Well, in about 2016, that's when I came to Family Church. And um, I would walk weekly with a guy named Pastor Will Irwin. And <laughs> as I was telling him about what I loved about the restaurant, he said, have you ever thought about ministry? And I said, no, I hadn't. And he said, well, I think you should pray about it. We have a position open at the church that you might fit really well. And I prayed and sought God and felt like that was what I was supposed to do. And so in 2016, I was hired on as the group's director. Um, and I was the group's director till. Last year, January 1st, I became the pastor of spiritual development. And that was a huge transition for you to go through to become a pastor. And we have a whole process here at Family Church. And and so that's what you've been doing for the last year. And uh, you've recently come to kind of a fork in the road. Uh, Why don't you describe that and how that has impacted your future course? Yeah, so both Figaro's and at Family Church, I get to develop people. And that's what I've loved. Um, But about October, I started not sleeping at night. And honestly, I started blaming leadership of the season, uh, COVID fatigue, all these other things, but I just still couldn't sleep. And what I recognized was the peace of God had kind of removed. And that's what was going on. I was wrestling. And I really felt like God was asking me to choose. um, That I had these pizza restaurants and I had church. But really more importantly, it was, do I want to, equip people to be people helping people find and follow Jesus? Or do I want to be in the trenches of people helping people find and follow Jesus with non-believers? 
And so you went through kind of a process. Why don't you describe your process of how you made this decision? I think it's interesting. Yeah, so for two months, um, I put on the hat of I am selling my store and I will pour my life out here. And um, there's parts of that that excited me, but I still was not able to sleep. Um, I wasn't able to sleep. For two months, I kept thinking, and here's how I would do it. Here's what that would look like, and praying and asking God if this was the direction. And then after two months, I put on the other hat that I would be resigning at Family Church and pouring my life out there and waiting for what God had for me next. And that first night, I switched hats. I slept through the night. And honestly, in that moment, I was like, that's just because you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I really felt the peace of God um, in that moment. And so that led me my, to my decision to resign here. I was going to say, so insomnia is not always the way you follow God's leading. It's a little deeper than that. Um, so why don't you tell us specifically, when, when is your last day here at Family Church as our pastor of spiritual development? So it is a, not an April Fool's Day joke, but April 1st is going to be my last day. Okay. And uh, I have to say on behalf of Family Church staff, um, there's kind of a grief in us, in me, and an excitement. Um, there's a grief because Zach has been a valuable part of the team. He's got some wonderful insights in every discussion we're in. He's, he's really poured his heart out to train leaders and to, to care about our groups. Um, but I think at the bottom line, we are excited that God is working. And, and when God calls you to someplace different, all we can do is to say, that's exciting, what God's going to do. So why don't you tell us a little bit about two things. One, what have you learned while you were here at Family Church that maybe we'll, you'll take with you? Yeah, so I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, like I said, I was very passionate about people and developing them. But I've got the chance to work with peers. I've never gotten to work with peers before. Um, it, it was my dad was the majority owner, I was the minority owner, and then my employees. And that has shaped me more than anything else and honestly given me the confidence and freedom to find out who I am as a leader on my own and how God's wired me, and how that looks, and how that's different. I think also the systems that happen here are phenomenal. Um, and now that I'm looking at my restaurant and my people and saying, how can I systematize this? I uh, hear Crystal or Heather or Ed <laughs> asking me, that's a great plan, what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> and uh, those are some of the things that I've learned. So I will be more effective in being people, helping people find and follow Jesus. And that's exciting. And just to be clear... Zach and his family are going to be here at Family Church. This isn't a move to some other location. It's not a move. It's a move away from being in vocational ministry here at Family Church. And in some way, I really think it's a great opportunity for us to say, sometimes we talk, especially in a, in a ministry mindset, about how to live at church. And we don't really do as much to tell you about how to live in the world. And so in some subtle ways, we, we imply that that the ladder of spiritual development is always leaning towards being on staff somewhere, that vocational ministry. In fact, I know as a kid growing up, when somebody went out of the ministry, it was always said with grief and a bit of shame. And I think what we're trying to say clearly here is there's no bad reasons that Zach is leaving. He's leaving because God has called him into a new stage and a new season, and he's going to do it so that he can make disciples out of people to follow Jesus and make great pizza, I hope. And also that it's going to be a part of his future learning. And as he teaches others, it's going to be a part of how God uses us at Family Church to make an impact on this community. So, so what are you excited about in this next stage, in this next season? What, what would you say is exciting to you? I'm excited. One of the things I've learned in ministry is it, you, still, you are people helping people find and follow Jesus. And you are equipping others to do it. Um, you're also, you have a lot of, there's an administration side, uh, which is a lot yeah. of the job. And I'm excited to be unencumbered. In fact, <laughs> we're all ministers of the gospel. And I am excited to be unencumbered, I guess, is what I'm saying. And being on, the, on that front line. Um, and then coming to get advice from you guys, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great time for us to say, let's agree not to use the term full-time ministry anymore. Um, when people are in full-time ministry, it means you're a follower of Jesus. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're in a vocational church ministry. Uh, you should be in full-time ministry whether you're in church 
or whether you're making pizzas, that you're in full-time ministry. And we're going to miss Zach on the, the meetings and the leadership side of things, but we're going to be glad that you're still part of Family Church, and we look forward to seeing your ministry with the Conquerors and with your life group and the other things, whatever God leads you to continue. So thank you for all you've given, and I hope you'll take what you've received and do great things with it. Thanks, Paul. It reminds me of a global leadership summit I was at several years ago where a guy named John Maxwell described his transition from being a pastor of a Baptist church for many years, and now he was going to become a business consultant. And if you know about John Maxwell at all, he's, he's, uh, <laughs> he's actually been voted at, at one place as the number one leadership trainer in the world. And so he has had incredible prominence as a, as a leadership guru. But he's, his own story was that I've had a chance to personally share Jesus with more people who would never come to church than I ever had when I was the pastor at church. And so we lift up that kind of ministry and we, we say if that's your calling and if God has called you into any other kind of work besides church work, then he's got you there for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the king. So I'd like to give you a last challenge as we go on through that you are loyal to your individual calling, but that in this unity you are also loyal to the degree that God has called you to family church, that God has called you to be loyal to your church family. There was a guy I was talking to some years ago, and, and he had come to church here for a while, and then he'd gone somewhere else for a while for various reasons, and then he'd come back. And he, and he finally was telling me, Paul, I'm, I'm going to be back at family church. And, and I felt one of those Holy Spirit prompting moments, and I said to him, I hope if you come back to family church, it's because you are called to family church, not just because we happen to be the flavor of the month or the most convenient one at the moment. And, and I believe that. I believe that we need to be loyal to where God has called us and that we need to, to put ourselves in as much as entirely possible. But I also know that there are people who leave and sometimes they leave for good reasons and sometimes they leave for bad reasons. And it's interesting, as I was going down through 2 Timothy 4, the exact same thing has happened to Paul. He's wrestling with this personal loss. Look at this happens in verse 9 to 11. He says, do your best to come to me quickly, meaning Timothy that he's writing to. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. And then he goes on and he says, only Luke is with me, the writer of the gospel of Luke and the, of the book of Acts. And then he says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And I want to be clear, uh, Jan and I have been here for 35 years and uh, we have seen many, many people come and we've been seeing many, many people leave. And some of them, God moves them to a different location. Some leave and go to a different church and they leave for good reasons and they go and they're involved in a church. In fact, there are people from family church that are vitally involved on, as staff members on other churches. And we have a a brother, a brother relationship, a brother and sister in Christ kind of connection. And there are people who have left for bad reasons. They've left because something offended them or they were inconvenienced or they really wanted just to be comfortable. They didn't really want to be on mission. And I see this exact same thing that, that Paul is talking about. And, and then first of all, you hear the agony of Paul's heart. I want to read the next verse that it's not on the screen, but in verse 16 it says, at my first defense, now Paul is in jail and so he's being brought up in a court and he says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. You see, Paul uses the word deserted and he goes back and, it, and he says this, you see this Demas deserted me because he loved this present world. Demas left for a bad reason. He left because he was tired of living for the king and living for the kingdom, and he wanted to just go and, and live for the, himself in the world. And then that brings up a question and a challenge to you is, can you be counted on? Are, are you one of the, the families or one of the individuals that when Family Church says, we have a team and we're going to make a difference in Douglas County, we know that you can be counted on. And I know that this has been a difficult season. And I know that some of us, I was asking, does this person still come to family church? And I'm honestly saying, I have no idea. 
Um, because it's a little hard to tell when some have to stay home and some are able to be here in person, that there are many different seasons and many different tests and the winds come and the waves come. And I guess my challenge to all of us is, can you be counted on? If you, if you leave, would you leave for the right reasons and have the right kind of discussion and do it with the kingdom of God in mind and not leave for wrong reasons because you're offended or or because something doesn't fit you or is not comfortable. And I want to explain that a little more, but I want to show you another little piece in this last part that I just read. Paul says, Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Now John Mark had gone with Paul and Barnabas on one of their early missionary journeys. And uh, if you read the devotions in your, in your outline this week, you'll, you'll go through that passage. And John Mark flakes out and goes home. And, and so the next time Barnabas... Good old Barnabas wants to bring him along again. And in fact, he's related to Barnabas. And Paul says, nothing doing. And they had this huge <laughs> disunity. They, they broke apart because of that. And then Barnabas is able to help rehabilitate John Mark. And now at the end of his life, it's kind of cool that, that Paul is saying, John, he did desert us. He did leave for the wrong reasons. And now he's back. And he is faithful and he is helpful and he's useful. And I think what a beautiful picture of redemption. So I want to give you a little chart and help you understand what we're talking about here. So think carefully with me about your connection. And over on the right-hand side of your page, there's this chart. And we talk about what does it mean to be committed? And we use the term upper story and lower story. Now, we talked about this over a year ago, so you probably don't remember it. But the whole idea is that we are committed, first of all, to Christ, that the gospel is central to everything. And then there are upper story, high level commitments, and then there are lower story, which are more lower level or beginning commitments. Let me just explain. When people come to church, they often come because there's a program. You have something for my kids. Uh, I like the way you do youth ministry. Or, man, that that song, I love that band that you have on stage. And, And those are the things that often draw people initially and we enjoy and they're good things. And, and then there are things that we do in connecting with each other in life groups and relationships. And so often people come to a church and they're committed because their friends are here and they enjoy that, that community and that's a wonderful thing. And then God uses different personalities. And by that we mean speakers and leaders and, and all the way through the scripture, God has raised up men and women and people have followed and connected to them in unique ways. And, and there is a a sense in which that loyalty is a wonderful thing and it is it is a part of what we see in the New Testament. And then the last one is people just get kind of complacent and they liked being in a place. Um, maybe my grandpa was here. Maybe we gave a bunch of money and they remodeled it and now I was a part of that. And, and it's just very familiar. And, and so here's the question. All of those things are good reasons to come and things we enjoy. But the question is, is what am I really committed to so that if, for example, if Pastor Ed and I, as we are not going to be here forever, and as we're handing on to a younger group of leaders, are, are people going to say, well, my guys aren't here anymore, I'm leaving? Or if your friendship circle, if somebody leaves and goes to a different church or moves, is that a reason for leaving? Or if, or if something happens that a program that you loved um, or were a part of, and programs tend to have a shelf life, are you going to say, okay, I'm out? And I ask you that because I think in our terms of our faithfulness and loyalty, we need to ask ourselves the question is, am I loyal? And am I loyal to the right things? And so our challenge and our encouragement to you is that your loyalty be about the upper story and the mission of people helping people find and follow Jesus. And that you come to family church because you believe that we are shooting at the right target and that we are being more or less effective at helping people do that. And lives are being changed and, and God is at work. And, and you see how that's such a bigger question than is my favorite program there or my favorite person. And it's not that the lower story commitments are wrong. It's just that we often put too much emphasis on them. The other thing we talk about a lot is our values. And the, the values that we've chosen to emphasize at Family Church are This idea of transformation, of not just sitting and learning intellectually, but head, heart, mouth, head, heart, hands, that our lives are changed. And and we're not just 
conforming to a church culture because of peer pressure, that the Holy Spirit is working inside of us and making us love Jesus more and making us want to have attitudes more like Jesus, want to have a unity more like Jesus and, and, and the Trinity. So the question is, is, am I committed to that? And then we talked about relationships. Am I, am I willing to open up and be honest in a grace-filled relationship base where I can share my struggles and be heard and where I can help others? And then innovation means we're going to try to do things in creative and new ways. We're going to have campuses and we're going to do video and we're going to do uh, different ways, different times because the same old thing gets to be just loyal to the wrong thing and that is to just old traditions. And then, of course, multiplication. And multiplication means not only do we see disciples multiplying disciples and groups multiplying groups and campuses multiplying campuses and leaders multiplying leaders, but we also have got to accept the fact that God is at work building his kingdom. And Pastor Ed was saying, you know, I think we used to think about when people left the church, that was a loss. And now the reality is if they leave the church because they're following God's calling and they go somewhere else and they are invested and plug in and maybe begin to to take the things they've learned here and invest them somewhere else, then that's a win. That that a church is going to be raided is going to be raided more on our sending capacity than our seating capacity. And I think that's really true, that multiplication is, is really about holding people with an open hand. And so I, I guess the challenge as we come to the end of the message here is to wrestle through what it is that you are committed to. And we all have a tendency to be committed selfishly, like that husband who was going to run from the avalanche. But instead of that, I, I would challenge you to, to be committed to what God has called you to, and that if you are called to family church, that you would pour yourself here in here, that you would be counted on, that you would be serving sacrificially and giving as much as you can and, and here enthusiastically. And if God calls you to go to somewhere else, that you would do exactly the same there and that you would stay for the right reasons or leave for the right reasons and that your faithfulness and your loyalty would be based on your relationship with Christ you're centered on the gospel and your desire to see the mission of God and the kingdom of God built. And if you're doing that, then whatever God calls you to, we want to applaud. We want to say, that is exciting. And God's moving Zach and Rachel in a little different ways and that's exciting because if God's putting them in a place where they will be more effective for his kingdom, then that, that is exactly what we want to see. That's what real multiplication is like. I'm going to hand off to the Campus pastors, as you close up here with a couple of thoughts about what does this loyalty look like and how can we recommit ourselves to the most important things. Thanks for being with us.